<laughs> Take a second and think about the best moment of your life. Can you remember what you smelled in that moment? What could you see? Could you feel the touch from someone else's hand on your skin? For me, one of these moments was in May 2021. I work in professional football, and the season of 2020-21 was incredibly hard. No fans in the stadium for the first time ever in history. A tremendous financial threat for the club, coupled with many problems in terms of sport, that led us to the following situation. At the end of the season, we needed to play the relegation round. That means two additional matches against a team from a second division with the ultimate goal to stay in the highest German division, the Erste Bundesliga. We lost game one at home in our own stadium with a score of 0 to 1. Additionally, we had to play game two in front of 2,500 rival fans only that had been allowed for the first time after seven months. We won game two with a score of 5 to 1. I remember the moments immediately after the match. The sound of the final whistle from the referee's pipe followed by the yelling from our team, screaming out the relief from the immense pressure of the weeks and months before. The feeling of the warm sun in my face, the smell from the grass of the pitch, and obviously a little later of the beer. This memory is the result of many different sensory informations received by my brain. To perceive our environment, sensory signals need to be interpreted in the context of our previous experiences and our current goals. The result of this interpretation allows us to interact with our environment and forms out the pictures and emotions in our brains. But have you ever thought about the quality of your sensory information? In other words, how good is the input that your brain receives every millisecond from all of your senses? For example, from a touch on your skin. When you have a scar or damaged nerve after an operation, you might have noticed that touching specific areas feels different than normal. Or maybe you had a virus infection or concussion in the past that had a permanent impact on your ability to smell or taste something. For our brain, this little numbness on the scar, the decreased ability to smell, equals a lack of information. But why does it matter? If you think of incontinence, in everyday life, it is probably less embarrassing when your brain has a clear understanding about the fact how full your bladder is at any given moment. In economical contexts, we're often really concerned about accurate data. We want detailed sales reports to see if we're hitting our targets or if there's enough liquidity for our company. In most cases, we have at least a rough plan in place that there will be enough money on, in our bank account by the end of each month, either to pay rent or health insurance. So, in a sports-specific context, as a neuroathletic trainer, it's exactly my job that the brains of professional football players receive the best possible information while it's under pressure and under heavy physical strain. Precise information from every sense often equals the difference between winning and losing. So, for example, when the brain of a football goalkeeper does not receive the same high-quality picture from each of the two eyes, the ability for depth perception is decreased. In a sport-specific context, this visual deficit can have a huge impact on performance. Why? You need depth perception to get a clear understanding about where exactly the ball is in space and how quickly it approaches you. Now think of a striker shooting at the goal and the ball moves with 150 kilometers an hour. That's damn fast. It makes a difference if that goalkeeper exactly knows where the ball is in space and can make a clean catch and keep the ball or has to clear the situation by fisting so the other team can possibly receive the rebound and maybe scores with a second try. 
We should want our incoming sensory information to be as good as possible. On the most basic level, our nervous system does four things. It receives input, it puts, it's, uh, integrates this input and puts all senses into context, it makes an interpretation and creates an output once a decision threshold is reached. Usually, the output is a movement as the result of the interpretation. And while we move, we receive new input, and generally, this loop happens subconsciously. Now, what's the ultimate goal of this loop? Making decisions to ensure our survival. And everything we do to survive is guided through movement. Think of eating, drinking, sex, running away from a dangerous situation, or even communication. Everything we do is a complex interplay of muscular contractions. And that's the real reason why we have brains, to produce complex and adaptable movement. Making decisions is a major part in eating behavior, to give you another example. So when I just said it's our brain's job to ensure our survival, I would probably risk the statement that eating and drinking are crucial in this context. Every second, your brain receives a ton of information about what's going on inside yourself, such as your heart rate, your temperature, pain, or the level of your blood sugar. Now, what potentially happens when your brain constantly receives unclear information about your current state of energy? Can it predict with accuracy how much and how often you should eat to match upcoming energy demands? Can it sense hunger and satiety properly? Can it guide an adequate eating behavior? Research currently cannot answer these questions with certainty. But over the last 30 years, there's a steady accumulation of evidence that supports the hypothesis of an accurate interceptive function being linked to eating behavior. Now, let's do a quick test for your interceptive ability right now. You're already leaning back in your seats. Probably it's easier when you close your eyes. Pay attention to your heartbeat. Now try to feel every single heartbeat. OK, thank you. Now give me a feedback and raise your hand if that was easy for you. OK, about 50% up, uh, hands up here. I could also see a couple of you using your hands touching the chest area. What does that tell me? Your brain is having a hard time in feeling your heartbeat and tries to get more information with another sense. One study looked exactly at this heartbeat detection skill in financial traders. What the researchers found was better interoceptive skills in these financial traders compared to a control group from the normal population. Surprisingly, what they also found was that this interoceptive ability predicted the relative profitability of uh, financial traders and remarkably how long they survived in the financial markets. So this data suggests that the gut feelings of financial law, to quote the study, contributes to economical success in the markets. No wonder that interoception is also often called the sixth sense. So, what are reasons for lower quality input from our senses? Every day, there's something happening called life. One of my mentors always said that life is a full contact sport, and at a certain point, you get hit. So nearly every one of us has at least experience in one of the following situations. You participated in the sport. These are the patients I usually work with. Or you maybe you just fell on the stairs from a ladder or from a horse. You heavily knocked your head somewhere. You had been involved in a motor vehicle accident. You had been a victim of an assault. Or you just fell on your face while you were drunk. So head injuries also called concussions or traumatic brain injuries, often lead to unclear sensory information even when they are mild. And you don't need to suffer direct impact to your head. Symptoms after whiplash injuries in car accidents are quite similar. 90% of all concussions happen without loss of consciousness. 
This is why the majority of people is not even aware that they had an injury of the brain. And if you're not aware of an initial injury, it's even harder to realize that long-term consequences are connected with a disturbed wiring of the brain. Axons of neurons get disturbed because of acceleration, deceleration, or rotational forces impacting the brain. So what are consequences? Problems with thinking, memory, attention, mental and physical health. But in general, all senses can be affected. Persons often have motor deficits. Athletes have higher injury rates after a concussion. Other long-term issues are often problems with pain. So for example, head, neck, shoulders, and back pain. To give you an example from our practical setting, we often see the sense of vision being affected. So reductions in the visual field, problems with eye movements, blurry vision, or problems with reading are common. And when we read and focus things close to us, our eyes have to move inwards, like in this picture. So to test this on yourself, take your thumb, look at the nail of your thumb, and bring it as close as you can towards the root of your nose, and bring it out again. Maybe do that two or three times. It's OK when your thumb gets blurry in the end. It's not OK when you see it double at any time. So the technical term for this is convergence. For the majority of us, convergence is an essential skill, since we spend several hours a day reading, sitting in front of a computer, or looking at our smartphones. 50% of patients after a concussion have a so-called convergence insufficiency. That means your eyes cannot do this skill. So these are photos of a software developer I worked with in the past. He complained about frequent headaches after computer work and screen time, up to the point where he had to quit working because of a severe migraine. When you look at his eyes, this is how this pencil push-up, how we call it in a practical setting, looked in the end. The moment where both of the eyes are not pointing at the same spot, this is where you perceive double vision. Or you, maybe you have seen your thumb double when you tested it a second before. In athletes, dysfunctions are often much harder to see. So if you take a look at this video, this is a football player I worked with. Two years after a concussion, he complained about um, a not accurate timing on headers, and that he already noticed that his left eye feels a little blurry compared to a sharp image when he uses his right eye only. So this is how it looks like. You can see that his left eye is not moving as well as the right eye. But like I said, in athletes, it's uh, often much harder to see. But here are the good news. You can train the brain, and you can train your senses. Both of the ex uh, showed examples got rid of their individual dysfunctions after six to eight weeks of a combination of vision and vestibular training. The Brock string in this picture, or the so-called pencil, pencil push-ups, are just two examples of tools or exercises we use in a practical setting to train convergence. Contrary to popular belief, the brain doesn't stop developing at a certain age. The ability of the nervous system to change in response to a stimulus is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the base for learning and further development independent of age. Even though it's a complicated process that's still being elucidated, however, the concept can be applied in terms of brain injuries and functional impairments. So in our practical setting, we see it all the time that athletes get better in their visual skills or in their balance skills or whatever uh, sense we are working on. Um, and to give you examples from the world of sports, better visual skills in studies lead to better real game statistics of hockey players and betting statistics of baseball players. Vision training for older adults helped to mitigate the age-related declines in contrast vision and visual acuity that increased the risk of falls and vehicle accidents. In closing, I think it's important to say that there's a strong and healthy debate about the efficacy of a so-called brain training or perceptual cognitive training. But there are two elements that are crucial when you work with this kind of topic. A, practitioners need to follow the set principle. That means specific adaptations to impose demands. 
You cannot expect to get a high-level athlete getting better at playing football while playing an unspecific video game. You have to relate the training to the individual dysfunctions, to the sensory profile of the sport, to the sport-specific movements and the sport-specific environment. B, you can get better by eliminating everything that weakens you. Getting rid of the one dysfunction that causes pain or disturbs your attention and you will be able to focus better on the task at hand, no matter if it's in sports or in business. Showing you people I work with, this uh, is a person I work with to improve her golf swing. And yes, you can improve a golf swing or the ability to rotate your spine through improving your visual system. I witnessed a boardroom full of high-level executives being completely exhausted after five hours of a tough meeting. And they continued energized after eight minutes of a movement break, incorporating the use of different senses. I've experienced the people's happiness getting freed of pain after years of living a constrained life. I work with children getting better at school up to two grades and gained a tremendous amount of self-esteem or confidence with 10 weeks of vision training. I work with athletes that struggle to live their daily life after a concussion or had been told that their career potentially ends with the next injury. And they came back to their sport and succeeded on the field for years. And in my opinion, the message that improving sensory information for your brain can have an impact on every aspect of your life and can improve it is an idea worth spreading. Thank you.